Hello everyone and welcome back to another episode of the Internet Computer Developer Journey. In today's episode 3.3, Certified Data, we're going to be take, taking a closer look at certified variables and how canisters can utilize certified data. So if you recall, in a previous module in 2.2, Advanced Canister Calls, we briefly talked about certified variables. But in today's episode, we're going to dive deeper into certified variables and discuss further the concept of certified data. So in that tutorial, we talked about the fact that certified variables are used as a way for queries to return an authenticated response that can be validated and trusted since typical query calls do not go through consensus and therefore their response cannot be certified. But using certified variables, developers can make query calls that do return an authenticated response that they can trust. This is great for workflows that require additional layers of authentication, like decentralized exchanges or any application that deals with important user data. So when we go to set certified variables, they're going to be set using an update call to the canister, since you need to use an update call to change the canister state, and that call is going to go through the consensus process. Once the certified variable is set, the certification can be read in future query calls that return the certified variable in response to the query call in a trustworthy and secure way. So certified variables are just one portion of a more broad concept known as certified data. Certified data uses chain key cryptography at the canister level to generate a digital signature that can be validated using a permanent public key that belongs to the ICP mainnet. That key's private counterpart is constantly distributed across many different nodes on the network, and a valid signature can only be generated when the majority of nodes that store the components of that private key cooperate in a cryptographic protocol. So now let's talk about how data is certified. Certified data can be used to certify assets that are stored in the canister's front end. When a canister issues a response along with its certificate, an HTTPS gateway can be used to verify that the certificate is valid before passing the response off to the client. In each round of message ex execution on ICP, the message routing layer generates a new state tree that contains that round's information. The tree contains a root hash that is then used by the nodes on that subnet to create a certificate. This state tree contains several pieces of information, including the certified variables of each canister. And we can take a look at an example state tree hierarchy in this code snippet highlighted here. This example here highlights where certified data is stored in the tree. Note that the certified data of a canister is limited to being only 32 bytes long. If a canister needs to verify more than 32 bytes of information, the canister must hash that data before it can certify it. Each piece of certified data is going to have a data certificate, and each certificate is going to have the root hash of the state tree and a Merkle proof that validates the certified data belongs to a tree that hashes that root hash. So how can a canister certify data in their workflow? So typically a canister can use the workflow where a canister first must construct a hash tree that maps the paths of HTTPS resources to SHA-256 hashes. So an example can be found in this code snippet here. Then a canister is going to compute the root hash of the tree by calling the ic0.certified underscore data underscore set method with the bytes of the hash for the argument. And then lastly, an ic hyphen certificate header is added to each certified HTTP response. Canisters can use several different API methods to interact and change its certified data by calling the ic0.certified underscore data underscore set method, which is used to update the canister's certified data. And remember that this data cannot be longer than 32 bytes. It can also use the ic0.data underscore certificate underscore present method, which returns a one if a certificate for data is present or a zero if it is not currently present. And lastly, the ic0.data underscore certificate underscore size or the ic0.data underscore certificate underscore copy method. These are used to copy the certificate for the current value of the certified data to the canister. So these are methods that the canister can use to certify data, but how does a developer use these methods 
and write code that certifies data. So developers can certify their data in two primary ways. Code can be written that explicitly manages and certifies all assets. In this workflow, the developer needs to construct a tree that contains all assets, merkleize that tree, and then compute its root hash. And to do that, they can use the IC certified assets library if they are developing in Motoko or Rust. Alternatively, developers can create a dedicated asset canister. You are probably familiar with this by now in our developer journey that new projects created with DFX create an asset canister that is titled the front end canister. Any canister can be configured to be an asset canister by setting the canister's type as assets in the dfx.json file. By setting the canister as an asset canister, the canister's boilerplate code manages and certifies all assets in the background. So I mentioned the certified assets library that can be used for Motoko and Rust. And so here are two code examples, one for Motoko and one for Rust that showcase how to utilize those libraries. And then lastly, before we get into the interactive portion of this tutorial, we need to briefly discuss generating HTTPS responses. This is because when a canister would like to return a certified asset to a request, the request body will contain the asset and a response header with the name IC certificate and a value equal to the asset certificate. So as a brief example here, you can take a look at the index.html asset of the internet identity canister, which has the canister ID of rdmx6-jaaaa AAA, et cetera. The SHA-256 hash of this asset at the time that it was re retrieved is going to be this value here. And this response contained the header of IC certificate, certificate equals, and then it's going to be a long hash value. And then by using that header, you can extract the following data. You can take a look at the root hash, the tree hash, the signature, the time of the certificate, and then the certificate tree. So now let's take a look at how we can use certified variables in an interactive example. So for this example, you're going to need to set up your developer environment according to the instructions in the developer environment setup module, which was tutorial 0.3. And then you will also need to install MOPS, and this was covered in the module 3.1, Motoko Package Managers. So first, we're going to go ahead and create a new project. We're going to use the DFX start clean background command to make sure that our instance of DFX is running. Then we're going to clone a existing example for this tutorial. We're going to use git clone, and then I'm going to copy the URL from the code snippet here to make sure that I don't have any typos. And so this is a project called certified cache, and then we're going to navigate into that certified cache directory. So now we need to install some packages with MOPS, and I just went through and installed these or tried to install these in the order that they're listed in the docs here. But you actually need to install this bottom library first, the IC certification library, since the other two libraries depend on this IC certification library, or at least in this project they do. And so first you need to do MOPS install IC certification at 0 0.0.1. We can, oh, we can see that I made a typo. And then we can install MOPS install base at 0 0.8.0. And then we can install MOPS SHA-2 at 0 0.0.2. Okay, now that we've got our packages there, we can go ahead and take a look at the source code that is already written in this project that is for creating an HTTP request. So we are going to open up our Visual Studio. I'm going to open my developer journey folder and then that certified cache folder. And then I'm going to make this a bit bigger and put my window over my CLI over here. And 
And so here we're going to take a look at the source folder and then the demo.mo file. If we adjust these windows just a little bit so we get a little bit more on VS Code. So we can see that we start off by importing a series of packages from various different libraries. And then we define an actor called self. This is going to define a couple custom types of HTTP request and HTTP response. It's going to create a variable called two days in nanos where it does some math to calculate the amount of nanoseconds in two days. Then it's going to create an array, a variable called entries. And this is going to define a variable called cache, which has a type of certified.cache. And then we're also going to define a public query function to return keys. So the piece of code that is highlighted in the tutorial here is the bit that defines the HTTP request. And so if we take a look at this in this function, if the HTTP query request returns a response of 200, that is defined here in let response status code nat 16 200. This indicates that it was a successful request and it returns the certified or the certification header. And so we can see that here in headers, it's going to return that cache.certification header. If the query returns a status code of 404, so if case null returns status code equals 404, it means the request has failed and the request is going to be upgraded to an update request. Then if the HTTP request update function is called, which is this function down here, then this function upgrades the request to an update call, which is stored in the cache with a certification. So then the next time that the call is queried, it can be returned with a certificate and a status code of 200 instead of error 404. So if we take a closer look at this request here, it is a update request, it defines the URL as the request URL. Um, it includes a time and message variable. And then it has the response defined as the HTTP response with status code 200, the headers, the body. And then the other functions and definitions in the rest of this code define a function for the page template. So this is going to be the body of the HTTP request. And then it's going to also define a function for getting the colors principle or the canisters principle. And then a function for the main page of the HTML page. So let's take a look at using this in action. So if we go back to our command line window here, if we go ahead and use dfx deploy, it's going to deploy this certified cache canister on our local replica that's running with dfx. And it's going to give us the canister ID, which we can then use to make a request to the canister. So to interact with this canister, we can use a curl call. So we're going to use curl HTTP localhost. Then we are going to insert the variable for dfx info web server port. So what this does is it's going to run this command, dfx info web server port, and it's going to store it as text in this um, string that we are passing to curl. And then we will add canister ID equals, and we're going to do the same thing for dfx canister ID, and then our canister name is, our canister name is going to be cache. So 
So we can see that first it's going to say request was not found in cache, update, upgrading to update request. So in the code here, it tried to run this query function to return the certified data for the request, but it got the case here of status 404. So then it ran this function here where it upgraded the request to an update request. So then it says storing request in cache, and then it's going to give us the response of the query request now that it has been stored in cache. And so we can see that the URL is that canister ID that we passed to the curl request. The method is get, there is no body, and then we have the timestamp of the request. So now if we go ahead and make this call again, we won't see this request was not found in cache since now our request is found in the cache. So we can also get this information by using the Candid interface. So if we open the um, backend canister via Candid interface URL that was outputted when we deployed the canister, we can open that in a new tab and we can make an HTTP request by querying. And we can see that it's going to return a full response. And at the bottom, it's going to be status code 200. We can see that our request that we made that was not initially not found in cache and then upgraded to an update call and then stored in cache is now able to be called using the first function, the HTTP request, the query function. And so that is that first that first function that's defined in the code there. And so that's going to wrap up today's episode of the Internet Computer Developer Journey. If you enjoyed today's episode, be sure to like and subscribe to the Definity YouTube channel to stay up to date when we release new episodes in the series. If you have any questions, be sure to leave them in the comments below, or you can check out the developer forum and developer discord server to chat with other developers on their Internet Computer Developer Journey. That's it for today. Take care, everyone.